Arika Tan Griffith, and I'm the co director of the Center for Jewish Studies here at Florida. Um, on behalf of the Center for Jewish Studies and the New York Public Library, I want to warmly welcome everyone here this evening. Um, whether you've joined us in person, as many of you have, thank you, um, and those of you on Zoom. And I want to especially extend a warm welcome to our Jewish Studies fellows who are undergrads and grad students and law school students, um, as well as those who might be joining us um, because this is the start of Fordham's first um, Jewish heritage celebration, of which this event is also a part. So thank you for coming, and we're grateful uh, to be here together to learn together. Before I introduce today's event, I would like to invite you to some of our upcoming programs that we're hosting this week and next. On Sunday, April 7th at 11 a.m., artist Deborah Ugaretz will hold a paper cutting workshop in conjunction with the exhibit that we have on display um, at Walsh Library called Knife Paint Word. Um, and if you haven't seen the art uh, on display yet, you should, and that might motivate you to also come um, and do some paper cutting yourself. Um, on Monday, April 8th at 6 p.m., Marilyn Miller will deliver a lecture about Cuban independence leader Jose Marti and his Jewish supporters here at Lincoln Center, also part of our New York Public Library Fordham Partnership. And on Thursday, April 11th, here um, at Lincoln Center at 1 p.m., Pablo Lerner will speak at a lunch seminar on legal perspectives related to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And this is just a small sampling of events, um, and we have many others planned, and so I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter if you don't already get it. Today's event is co-hosted with the New York Public Library, and it's part of our Fordham New York Public Library lecture series um, and our Jewish Studies Research Fellowship Program. So I want to thank our colleagues at the New York Public Library for partnering with us for so many years already. Um, Mila um, Sholokova, Amanda Siegel, Matt Nutsen, and Melanie Loki. And it's always wonderful to work with them. And I also want to extend a thank you to Magda Tedder, who co-directs the Center for Jewish Studies with me, Siobhan Verleza, our center's administrator, um, Roger Van Allen, our director of development um, for all the work that they do on behalf of the center and to our special events team and to our program's sponsors um, and to the members of our advisory council without whose generosity we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do. Today's lecture is um, uh, will be delivered by Rivka Elitur Lyman. Rivka received her PhD from Tel Aviv University, where she wrote her dissertation on Jewish Aramaic amulets from late antiquity, um, and where she really shifts our focus from texts that are widely studied and canonical to texts that are very rarely studied, but that illuminate a whole new perspective on Jewish antiquity and on popular practice. She served as a postdoctoral fellow at both New York University and Harvard University Center for Jewish Studies, where she worked on several projects, including an article on a rare Jewish Aramaic lead curse tablet, tablet written um, to win a chariot race and found hidden under the Hippodrome of ancient Antioch. As a fellow of the Fordham New York Public Library Research Program in Jewish Studies, she's working on ancient Jewish Aramaic amulets that made their way from the Middle East to New York over 100 years ago. And on a personal note, um, I, I have been Rifka's neighbor for the last two years and have had many conversations about um, antiquity and a lot else. And so it's an especial privilege to be able to welcome you today. In her talk today, titled Magic in New York, Reassessing a 1900s Collection of Late Antique Jewish Amulets at the New York Public Library, she will explore ancient Jewish amulets their magical and cultural significance, the history of the collection, and the role that Mar Mary Ann Draper created, uh, played in creating them, all based on research that she's done uh, while here in New York. Um, this lecture represents a rare combination in which the history of New York and religion in New York and the history of Jewish antiquity collide, and I'm looking forward to learning together today. So thank you, Rebecca.
hear me? Like that? Okay. Thank you very much, Sarit, for the fine introduction. And I wanted to thank you and Professor Magda Tetter from Fordham University, as well as to Dr. Mila Shalokova and the staff of the New York Public Library for hosting me this year, assisting me with my project, and guiding me through the collections and archives in the library. And thank you for the opportunity to give this talk today and to present my research. Thank you to all of you uh, for coming in this rainy day. I start my, my presentation miles away from New York and many centuries before New York was established. That is in Palestine between the fourth and the early seventh century CE. During this period, Jews used a specific type of amulet to protect themselves from illness, demons, and danger. These amulets were made of thin leaves of silver, copper, or gold, which were engraved with incantations and magic spells. The amulets were small, measuring only a few centimeters, but the inscriptions were so tiny that each item could accommodate hundreds and even thousands of letters and magic signs. After they were inscribed, the metal leaves were rolled or folded up and put either, either into a small metal cylinder or into a simple fabric folder. Their owners kept, kept these amulets close to their bodies, often wearing them as a necklace or jewelry. And here I brought up um, examples. You can see here a nice uh, example of uh, such a silver amulet. You can see that it's engraved with Hebrew letters, maybe some of you can recognize it with some of the light. Uh, and after this thing, uh, um, you should like, whatever. And, and after this thing would, uh, uh, was engraved, it would be rolled or folded and put into this tiny or this type of cylinder and then worn on the body. And this is an example, a nice example from Fayum Mami Fortress. This is not Jewish, but you can, we can assume that this is the way also Jews use this, uh, this item. Though quite rare, to date we are aware of only 110 amulets of this type. These amulets shed light on many important aspects of Jewish culture in this period, from magical traditions to the daily lives of the Jews and the dialect of the Aramaic they spoke. The first amulets of this type were published sporadically as early as the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And I will get back to that later, but the first major serious academic publication of Aramaic metal amulet was done by two Israeli scholars, Yosef Neve and Shaul Shaked, about four decades ago. In a series of two volumes that you can see here, Amulets and Magic Balls published in 1985 and Magic Spells and Formulae from 1993, Naven Shaked edited dozens of amulets and magic Jewish texts dated to the late antique and medieval periods, among them 32 metal Jewish amulets, most of which were read and published for the first time in these volumes. By doing so, in many ways, they introduced Jewish magic texts to the Jewish studies scholarly community, which at the time was more interested in rabbinic materials and in the epigraphic materials from the Judean desert then in the esoteric texts of uh, the amulets, which they viewed as an inferior genre transmitted by the uneducated lower stratum of the population, which is of course not true. Uh, in, the, in the introduction to their first book, Neve and Shaked included a short overview of all the amulets that came from the antiquities market and were published uh, early in the 20th century or before. In addition to providing first editions of amulets found in archaeological excavations throughout the country, their book also included new editions of this group of amulets, meaning the amulets that have been published uh, before, with one exception, a collection of six amulets held at the New York Public Library and partially published in 1911 by J. Montgomery. This collection, Naven Shaked say, contains, and I quote, a group of six metal amulets which were donated by Mrs. Henry Draper. Their state of preservation is such that it is very difficult to improve much on Montgomery's reading, which in some cases are evidently wrong, they say, 
We have therefore decided to leave them out of the present publication, which otherwise aims at giving a complete corpus of the known Aramaic language. The Montgomery mentioned, uh, mentioned here is James Montgomery, a professor of Semitic languages from the University of Pennsylvania, who is known in the field of Jewish magic mainly for being the first scholar to publish an impressive edition of the incantation balls, which maybe some of you have heard of, uh, which were a specific type of late antique Jewish, um, Jewish amulet written with ink on clay balls and which were found in Nippur during the 19th century. His paper on the amulets mentioned by Neven Shaked included first editions of two silver amulets and one bronze amulet marked as amulet A, uh, B, and C. You can see here the photos are taken from his uh, uh, paper in 1911. Later for their second volume, Neven Shaked obtained better photocopies of the New York amulet, amulets from which they were able to produce new and improved readings of the three amulets edi edited by Montgomery. Following his original sequence, they republished Montgomery's amulet A as A27, amulet B as A28, and amulet C as A29. And I'm sorry uh, about the details, but I will get back to them later. So it's important to mention that. Neven Shaked recognized that the silver amulets A27 and A28 uh, were both written by the same scribe to, to protect a pregnant woman named Sarah, daughter of Marian and her fetus. And the bronze amulet, A29, was written to expel the evil eye from a man named Georgius. Um, Neven Shaked's note about a mysterious collection of six, um, six Jewish Aramaic amulets at the New York Public Library, partially published more than 100 years ago, immediately caught my attention. In my dissertation, I created an updated catalog of all the known um, Jewish amulets from this type. Um, and um, <clears throat> in museums and uh, private collections around the world and counted 110, as I mentioned before. Most of the amulets um, in the list that have not been discovered by the Israel Antiquities Authority or in academic archaeological digs are, are distributed in various collections around the world with just one or two items in each location. Against this background, the NYPL collection containing six amulets that have been kept in New York since 1911 is definitely an unusual case. I went back to Montgomery's paper from 1911. Montgomery gives a basic report on the provenance of the amulets he publishes. He cites the bulletin of the New York Public Library from 1908, reporting on the donation of the amulets. Three Hebrew, and I quote, three Hebrew amulets of silver and two of gold in silver and glass frames. One of the gold amulets having attached a the gold cylinder case in which it was worn, all having been found at Irvid in the Hoan and belonging in date to about the second to the fifth century AD. And this is something that I say 100 years later, this is uh, not accurate. Today we know that they start on the fourth century and uh, disappear on the beginning of the seventh century. So the bulletin mentions a collection of five amulets which differs, differs from Neve and Shaked's report of six. Moreover, the bulletin mentions only three silver and two gold amulets. There is no mention of the bronze amulet published in Montgomery's paper as amulet. See, this is uh, cited in Montgomery's paper himself, but he doesn't mention the, the bronze amulet that, that he publishes. This uh, this was my starting point when I went to the rare books room at the New York Public Library and asked to see the ancient Jewish amulets in their collection. Um, I found there a box of four amulets. Uh, one, two, three, and four. Two silver amulets, one gold, and one bronze. The silver and gold amulets were all kept in modern frames of glass and uh, ornamented silver. You can see them uh, here in the, in the photos. 
and I, uh, which is mentioned in the bulletin report cited by Montgomery. He said that they are, uh, um, they are in a silver and glass frames. The bronze amulet not mentioned in the bulletin was kept in a simple plastic pouch. From a closer look at the amulets, I could tell that one of the silver amulets was Montgomery's amulet B. Sorry, and a gold container. Not, I'll get back to that. So one of them was uh, Montgomery's Amulet B, which equals Neven Sheket's A28, meaning it was published already. The bronze amulet in the simple plastic bag was Montgomery's C, Neven Sheket's A29. So I have two of them that have been published before. The other two have never been published. The box also contained a gold capsule and a label written on a typewriter that says two gold amulets bearing here, this is the, the note, two gold amulets bearing Hebrew inscriptions and the case in which one was worn, found at Irvid in the Quran, presented by Mrs. Henry Draper, 1908. Over the printed letters, someone has crossed, uh, sorry, someone has crossed out the words Irvid at the Quran and wrote instead at Beisan. Beisan is the Arabic name of modern town Bechian in the Jordan Valley in Israel today. There was also another more modern note that said that amulets three and four and five, um, meaning two amulets, are, are on long-term loan to the Metropolitan Museum starting 2013. I therefore went north on the Fifth Avenue to the Metropolitan Museum there in a small vitrine at the entrance to the medieval galleries here um, were, um, were three um, amulets, two silver and one gold. The three of them had the same modern silver and glass frames, which I again recognize from the report in the bulletin of the New York Public Library. One of the silver amulets in the vitrine at the Met um, is the second silver amulet published by Montgomery as amulet B. So here again, uh, which is equal to Neven Shaket A27. So here again, I have one amulet that have been published before. The other silver amulet and the smaller gold amulet have never been published. The amulets at the Met were locked in the vitrine and at this point I, point, I couldn't examine them. So I submitted a request to have them taken out, a bureaucratic process, which in such institutions takes time, and walked back to the New York Public Library where four amulets were accessible to me. I started um, with A28. In a Van Chaquette's edition, they had not been able to decipher a few of the lines, so I decided to start it there. In the last three lines of this amulet, I managed to read the following text. I seal by the covenant of Abraham and by the binding of Isaac and by dot, dot, dot. This is uh, where a uh, word is missing, but the text ends. This is the end of the inscription. This reference to the fathers of the nation, Abraham and Isaac, uh, and the special features attributed to them reminded me of a similar text I read in another amulet. I went back to Neven Shaked's book and checked their edition to, of uh, A27, one of the amulets locked behind the vitrine at the Met. Right? It begins with this text. And by the rod of uh, and by the rod of Moses, and by the front plate of Aaron the high priest, and by the signet ring of Solomon, and by the dot of David. These first lines of 827 can fit perfectly after the few last lines of 828 and link both amulets into one contiguous text. Considering Aven Shaked's observation that both amulets were written by the same scribe and for the same woman, we can now add that they were actually both part of a single text in which the practitioner wrote a set of incantations over one silver leaf, then ran out of space, space and continued on, on to another leaf as in a codex. Considering the identical size of the two amulets, I thought that maybe both of them were wrapped together and kept in one small container, uh, but I had no proof for this assumption. 
examining the rest of the unpublished amulets at, New York, at the New York Public Library. Um, here they are. I could understand why they were not published. The silver amulet is very badly damaged and the inscription is extremely uh, shallow. It is almost impossible to see anything except for a few letters and signs. The gold amulet uh, is in a better shape and I can read it partially, but in this case, the quality of the script is bad and its formulae are basic. After a few months, I received a permission to take the amulets from the vitrine in at the Met. Right? I had two hours to examine the objects and take photos. I managed to produce new readings for A27. This is A27 that confirmed my suspicion um, that the two amulets are linked and bear the, uh, one continuous text. The other silver amulet was again hard to decipher, which is probably the reason that it was never published. And the gold amulet turned out to be inscribed with a short Greek inscription, not Aramaic. Though hard, um, um, though hard to decipher, I'm hoping that new photographic and scanning technologies will help me provide edition uh, of the amulets that were never published. This part of my project still lies in the future, and I hope to execute it soon with the aid of the staff of the Metropolitan Museum and the New Republic Library. With a clearer idea about the collection of the amulets, I was still left with many questions. How did the amulets get to New York at a time when scholarship on objects like this were, uh, was still in such an early stage? Who recognized them and thought they were important enough to carry all the way from the Middle East to America? And how did they end up at the New York Public Library, an institution that primarily de dealt with books? In his paper, Montgomery, I'm getting back to him, gives some information about the circumstances under which the amulet got to the New York Public Library. He mentions two people involved in this donation, Mrs. Henry uh, Draper, the owner and donor of the, um, the amulets, and an anonymous antiquities dealer from New York City who testifies that the amulets were found in tombs excavated under his personal supervision at Irbid in the Huan in Syria. Um, some of them were found last summer and some uh, two and three years ago. This is a citation uh, of, of what the antiquity dealer told him. They were worn in cases of gold. Mrs. Draper has three or four of, go uh, of gold cases, sometimes in bone cases. Um, so Mrs. Henry Draper. Mrs. Henry Draper is uh, Mary Anna Palmer Draper, an American born in 1839 to a wealthy real estate investor. She was famous for taking part in the academic work of her husband, Henry Draper, a professor of physiology and chemistry at New York University, who was also an active astronomist. Draper was married only 15 years until her husband died. And after his death, she established uh, and funded a few important projects in his memory, including the Henry uh, Draper Fund and the Harvard College Observatory. But apart from that, Draper was interested in antiquities. She assembled a large collection of ancient Greek and Roman gems, glass vessels, uh, Egyptian artifacts, and even objects from China and East Asia. The letters and documents concerning her collection are housed at the New York Public Library. I started going over Draper's boxes to see if I could find information on the amulet collection. The boxes mainly contain letters Draper received from various people after her husband's there, with a few no notes or papers written in, in her own hands. Halfway through the archive, I understood that it is not on that it not only gave me access to more detailed information about my amulets, but that the archive is also a treasure trove for telling the story of Draper's collection and the story of antiquities collecting in New York in the early 20th century. The 
earliest documents that I could link to Draper's interest in antiquities were letters sent to her from Professor Ogden Rood. Starting 1890, Professor Rood consistently sent Mrs. Draper letters in beautiful handwriting, sometimes with nice drawings that you can see here in the illustration. The letters often take personal note tone. They are uh, full of details and descriptions about people he met, places he visited, vacations he took, and anecdotal experiences that he shared with uh, that he shared with her. Uh, a lot of gossip, so it was a lot to read. <laughs> Rude, a professor of physics at Columbia University, was known for his work in color theory, which was even relevant for works in, of contemporary artists, but he was also apparently knowledgeable um, in ancient Greek and Roman cultures, as is evident when he discusses items that Draper was considering buying for her growing collection. For example, in a letter from December 1890, he wrote, uh, on Saturday, I devoured nearly half of the book on gems. Miriam, this is a name of a professor, uh, a colleague of Ruud, says that you're right, and that Pergamu, and this is a word in, um, in Greek, uh, is probably the name of the gem cutter. And um, on December 1890, 95, Professor Wheeler improves on further acquaintance. He is quite wild over the seal used on this note and thinks it belongs to a newly discovered variety of intaglios dating back to Mr. Neal times. And in November 1899, my dear Mrs. Draper, you may remember that some weeks ago I promised to send you an impression from a Phoenician scarab in the King's collection, which is much in the same style with one of that you recently obtained from Tiffany. The subject is a couple of worshippers, et cetera, et cetera, uh, whom, uh, by whom we, we read in the Old Testament. The letters reflect, therefore, a friendly slash professional relationship where Draper describes for Rude her new purchases or consults with, consults with him about them. And in return, he shares his, uh, with her his general knowledge, and more importantly, it seems, his network of connections with professor who specialize uh, in this field. It is hard to determine at this, this point who is her main supplier of antiquities, whether Tiffany's, as mentioned in one of Ruth's letters, or other dealers. The letters from Ruth to Draper continue until 1899, three, years before Rude's death. An important development, development in Draper's collection happens around 1900 when she meets Mr. Aziz Hayat, here you can see him uh, in this picture, a unique antiquities dealer in New York at the time. Born to a humble Christian shoe, shoemaker from Tyre, Aziz Hayat came to New York at the age of 17 and worked for antiquities dealer in the city. After moving to the city of Haifa, today in Northern Israel, to get married, Hayat came back to New York with his new wife, uh, where he opened his own antiquities shop, for, first on 11th Street and then on the Fifth Avenue, not far from where the Empire State Building would be built a few decades later. later. Hayat was a unique dealer in America. Unlike most of the people in this business, he grew up in the Middle East. Rather than buying goods from locals and selling them in America, he, he ran the whole process, initiating excavations in the Levant to find antiquities, traveling with the artifacts to New York, and then selling them uh, here to local collectors and institutions. Hayat divided his life between Haifa and New York. During the summers, he would travel to Haifa with his family, from which uh, he would go to his digs. At the end of the summer, Hayat would return to New York to, mar to market his antiquities to his clients until the next spring and so on. Here, for example, uh, is a letter Hayat wrote to Draper from his office on 11th Street on July 10, 1900. Dear Madam, I am back from my Eastern tour of collection my trip was a successful one. I have gathered beautiful articles of glass, tangara, bronzes, stones, and other antiquities. I shall have all my collection here between three or four weeks. 
he is keen to give Draper the feeling that he is saving her the best things. I shall be glad to give you the first look uh, at my beautiful things. Some of them are unique. Have you never been, have you never seen anything like them in any collection? Many times his letters were accompanied by wax impressions of seals and gems that he was offering to her. Um, like in this letter where he concludes with the comment, I'm sealing my letter with a seal in Hebrew writing, which I brought uh, with me yesterday from Jerusalem. And here you can see in the letter, he's drawing the shape of the, of the seal. And this is still at the New York Public Library. You can see the wax impression. And if you get closer, it's hard to see in this uh, picture, but you can really see the Paleo Hebrew text of the, of the seal. I could even read a few letters. So yeah, it's really cool. Um, and here it is worth pausing for a brief uh, parenthetical aside to say that Hayat was very successful in his business. With the money he earned from selling antiquities, he bought quite a lot of real estate in Haifa, some of, uh, of which is still in his family's possession. One of his descendants, Dr. Nicole Hayat from Haifa, is researching Aziz Hayat and the role he took in shaping the antiquities trading market in America in the early 20th century. She says that although her great-grandfather had uh, many other businesses, antiquities always remained his passion. Nicole Hayat is now working on a paper on this topic and she kindly agreed to share with me some of her conclusions as well as these photos. And this is, uh, again, this is photos uh, taken during the excavations Hayat did in the Levant. This is, I believe, from somewhere near Haifa or the Mount Carmel. Look how many, how many people worked for him. And this is from later, a bit later period than what we are focused on um, from another place. But again, it's, it's in Israel. So it's in the same area. And this is a, um, a photo of Victor Hayat, his son, um, and it is uh, from their office at the Fifth Avenue. So you can see here this big vitrine with, uh, it's kind of faded, but uh, you can see uh, these necklaces inside that everybody who came could uh, get impression of, of what they're selling. Um, over the years, Anna Draper became a regular customer of Hayat. And at some point, he started sending her reports from his summer discoveries while in Haifa. Sometimes current events are men mentioned in the background of, of the correspondence, like for example, in 1909, when Hayat mentions how he and his family were saved from a massacre by the young Turks, probably referring to the events known as Ad Adana massacre in that year. Later, in a letter from uh, 1913, he mentions how World War I affected his work when the recruitment of young men to the battlefield left him with a lack of vigor. Some of his letters reflect the atmosphere in the Levant, which in those years was a lodestone for Western scholars interested in the archaeological sites of the Holy Land, many of whom were looking to mount expeditions. In a letter from June 1908, this is uh, in, in this slide, he mentions Oric Bates, an archeologist from Boston Museum who was digging at the biblical site of Sebastia while Hayat was digging in the, in the Huran. Hayat says that Bates was interested in purchasing antiquities from him. Mr. Oric Bates of Boston has been excavating at Sebastia for three, um, for three months by permission from the Turkish government or Boston Museum of Fine Arts, but they have not yet made any important find, he says. He invited me several times and made me good offers for many of my things. Hayat insists that this is not the way he works, but I would not part with them. I told him I sell my finds in New York and not here. A statement that was also meant to give Draper the feeling that he prioritizes her over the other potential customers. Hayat adds that Bates is very anxious to buy Gnostic amulets, and he heard of your collection of Gnostic amulets 
but I did not show him any of my best things. This is again a quotation from Chayat letter. And indeed it seems that Draper was not just buying any antiquities for her collection. Hayat and, other, and others sold her glass, coins, bronze, sculptures, cuneiform tablets, but more than anything, she was interested in ancient magic and amulets. Oric Bates, who was mentioned in Hayat's letter, uh, was not the only one who called her collection an amulet collection. In a letter sent her, to her by Nurian, another dealer in New York, he tries to sell her a Christian bronze amulet and promises, I will be at the lookout for you for interesting charms and amulets. Among her papers, I, I found some files that reflect her special interest in the field. For example, there is a booklet of an English translation of a Christian magic grimoire, as well as a long letter from Geo Black written as an answer to Draper's inquiry about the uh, contemporary superstition that marriage in May was unlucky. One of the only papers in the archives written in Draper's own hand is a copy she made for a review by Richard Gotthail, a scholar of Semitic studies about an inscribed Greek magic amulet. You can see it here. This is a whole letter that she's copying and this is the, almost the only uh, item in, in her archive that's in her own, own that was written in her, her, her hand. Um, um, and the many Greek and Roman gems and the Egyptian items in Draper's collection are treated in her letters as amulets. And it looks like she was specifically focused on this aspect of the ancient cultures from which she collected. And everything that you can see here is from her archive. And this is unusual. So there are not so many photos and there are not so many items like that. And what I do find are about, usually about magic amulets and charms. Hayat, who was aware of this aspect of Draper's interests, looked for specific items that would meet her demand. On September 12, 1905, Hayat writes to Draper, I take pleasure in announcing to you that I have succeeded in finding two amulets similar to the one I sold to Mr. Kung last year. The smaller one is written on gold and the larger one is written on silver. The silver one is more interesting. I will reserve them until you see them. The price of the silver amulet is $100 and that of the gold one is $75. And this is written more than 100, year, uh, 100 years ago. So you can, I don't know, triple that or, or even more. Uh, three days la later in another letter, he adds more details. The amulets were found at Irbid in the Horan, Syria, in the same locality where Mr. Kung amulet was found. They were rolled in silver cases. Um, these were thin and gone to dust. The amulets remained rolled and I kept them as they were found. The description of the amulets mentioned in these letters, of course, inscribed on gold and silver leaves and rolled in cases. Uh, fit the amulets held at the rare books room uh, and the, at the Metropolitan Museum, which brought me to this project in the first, first place. Uh, receipt from September 19th, 1905 shows that Draper bought the two amulets for that price Hayat asked. Um, I have it here. Uh, in the uh, receipt, Hayat repeats the details he mentions in the letters and refers again to another amulet of this type he found a year earlier, uh, which he sold to Tiffany and Co. This might suggest that Mr. Kung mentioned in the letters uh, before was a buyer from the auction house or somehow connected to them because before that he mentions another amulet that he sold in the previous year to Mr. Kuhn. So I think maybe it's actually the same, the same amulet. Hayat also mentions another amulet he found 10 years earlier, which he sold to the Louvre Museum. I don't know what happened to this amulet. And it's interesting to see because I never heard about an amulet in the Louvre. So we now, we now have one small gold amulet and one larger silver amulet in Hayat Draper's letters. In line with the report in the library's bulletin, 
they were both found in a tomb in Irbid. But out of the six amulets or seven amulets I saw at the New York Public Library and the Metropolitan, which ones are they? A letter sent by Dr. Gotthai to the librarian of the New York Public Library on December 1905 solves the reason. The inscriptions on the amulets are very illegible, he said, and he complains that what I, uh, what I have read of them has had to be done by reading from the back with the aid of a mirror and a magnifying glass coupled together. This is such a strain to the eyes that I have I had been a, unable to work for longer than a quarter of an hour at a time. And I, uh, from personal experience, I testify that it's really hard to read these uh, texts. And, and uh, so I identify with uh, Dr. Gotthail. Um, Still, he could recognize that the small gold amulet contains 17 lines and the silver amulet contains 32 lines. Based on this description, I can now say conclusively that the gold amulet draper bought from Hayat in 1905 is the, the gold amulet from uh, the NYPL collection, which is still kept in the rare books room to this day, this one and which has never been published. And that the silver amulet is a 27, a twin amulet of the other silver amulet, which is currently on display at the Met. And this is according to the line numbers. Hayat's description of the silver cases originally roping the amulet is significant. It suggests that counter to my assumption, the pair 827 and 828 were not rolled together in one container, but were treated as two distinct uh, objects, each of them folded separately. Um, and one more uh, comment in Gotthild's letter, let's go back to this, is worth mentioning at our, at our Oriental Club, he says, I was told that a similar silver amulet, which was in New York last year, which was much more legible. This remark again refers to another amulet that circulated in New York in the previous year, 1904, possibly the same amulet mentioned by Hayat as the one he sold to Mr. Kung or Tiffany or both. In a letter Hayat sent from Haifa in the following year, um, 1906, we learned that his excavations that summer produced an impressive harvest of Aramaic amulets. I found at Irbid in the Huan a bronze amulet with Hebrew inscription, similar to those you bought of me, he says. It was found in the same locality rolled with no case. The case has gone to dust again. Also, the edges of the amulet are eaten up. I hereby send it to you enclosed, and of course, we cannot know what he sent exactly. It looks to me to be very interesting, and being of bronze, it may have been for a different purpose, or for a poorer man. And this is a very interesting comment by Hayat. The writing is very clear. If you like it, you can have it for $75. A receipt from October 1906, and this is what the item you see here, shows that Draper bought this bronze amulet and in addition paid Hayat $150 for one silver amulet with Hebrew writing found in a gold case with a gold chain at Irbit in the Quran. $65 for one gold amulet found in a gold case at Beisan with a Hebrew inscription and $20 for one silver amulet with Hebrew inscription. Most of it is worn out. This is Hayat's word found at Irbid in the Quran, Syria. Comparing the amulets found in 1906 to the collection of the New York Public Library, we can now assume that the bronze amulet from Irbid described by Hayat as eaten up in the edges is the bronze amulet in the plastic bag from the New York Public Library, Montgomery's uh, amulet C and Aven Shaked amulet uh, 29. The gold amulet from Beisan, today Bet She'an in the Jordan Valley, and I remind you of the note that I showed you before, um, is probably the small gold amulet. Um, Display at, displayed at the Metropolitan. As I said, after examining the object, it turned out to contain Greek. 
but in all other documentation in the New Republic Library and the Met, it is cataloged under Hebrew. And it seems that this is the source for the mistake. The silver amulet described by Hayat as mostly worn out can be identified as the damaged unpublished silver amulet at the New Republic Library. And a look at the original can explain why it was sold at the lowest price uh, of the amulets. For the silver amulet sold to Draper for $150, I am left with two options. Either the unpublished silver amulet from the vitrine at the Met, or the silver amulet at the New York Public Library published as A28. I tend to think that um, it is the unpublished silver amulet displayed at the Met. A28 could be the amulet discovered by, um, by, the, uh, by Hayat um, a year earlier and sold to Tiffany's and Mr. Kung and possibly purchased by Draper from them for her collection or maybe by the New York Public Library. I don't have the do documentation, so I cannot tell. The fact that scholars in the city described it as similar to A27, its pair uh, might reinforce this, this conclusion. Either way, this amulet must have been donated to the New York Public Library before 1911, because in that year it was published by Montgomery. So it had to come to the library until then. I would like to conclude with one more uh, letter Hayat sent to Anna Draper from Haifa on April 1910. I received a letter from uh, from the Reverend J.A. Montgomery, he was also a priest, I think, uh, from the University of Pennsylvania, in which he informs me that he has translated almost completely one of your amulets, and he asks me to give him more information about it. Montgomery's mysterious antiquity dealer telling him about his excavations is now revealed. It is, of course, Mr. Aziz Hayat, the, pas the passionate a antiquity dealers, dealer from Haifa, New York, who together with Anna Draper, a New Yorker collector, collector with an affinity for ancient magic, created the earliest collection of late antique Jewish Aramaic amulets in New York. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, that was really wonderful, like a, a mystery right there. <laughs> um, Turn off the screen. Um, so that was a really great um, combination of a mystery, um, both of piecing together and deciphering the ancient amulets and also piecing together and putting together the story of how they ended up in New York. Um, and I'll just say that what you shared with us in the last 45 minutes or so is based on hours and hours and hours of very meticulous putting together um, um, of all the material. So that was really beautiful. I wanna open up to questions. Um, I have some of my own, but maybe we'll open up uh, to questions um, of all of you in the room and maybe some people also on um, the Zoom webinar that you can send in through the Q&A um, and we'll get started. I was wondering if you know anything about like the legal conditions of bringing antiques from Palestine to New York in the 1900s, like um, under Ottoman rules, like could he just you know, You're put his hand in the, the legal conditions. Was he like uh, uh, stealing things or smuggling them or? So, uh, yeah, it's not really, I, I'm not sure. I'm not uh, an expert to this period. Like I really went out of my comfort zone <laughs> with antiquity in this project. I th He for sure is uh, acting legally. He is very um, careful about it. He has one, uh, incident that he talks about in the letters and also was published in the newspaper of, of the time, I think it was in 1909, that uh, he went to New York with all of the, uh, the objects and somebody uh, said something to the people in the, um, 
customs. In the customs. And uh, they ran like a search on him and his family, and he was very insulted and he sued them. So he was very strict about it. And he, he explains in these letters, I always do things legally, um, but, um, but I, I think that um, it was, uh, so he talks about this auric base that he meets and he has permission from the Turks to dig because he comes from America. Aziz Hayat, as a, a, a person who lives there, I think he had his own uh, permissions, but I'm not sure, and it's a good question. We have a question online. Um, whether you could um, reflect on or explain the periodization of these amulets, given that the amulets continue to be written into the medieval and modern periods, are there characteristics specific to these amulets made in the fourth, seventh century that make them different from later amulets? So it's a good question because it is important to mention when we talk about these amulets that these things as uh, the, the person who was asking said uh, continued, continued and it's a long tradition and it's still in use today. The same, uh, not exactly, but the same traditions, the same formulae, same spells, incantations. So uh, from one hand, there is a long continue, continuous. Uh, on the other hand, the things that uh, differ this type of amulets from the others are, first of all, material. Um, they are written on these, um, these uh, very thin leaves of, of metal. And in late, once uh, the Muslim conquest um, happens, this disappear. I don't know why, but this uh, phenomenon disappears and people start to write amulets on other materials like papers or parchment and uh, also the, the text. And the texts are um, are in Aramaic, in Palestinian Aramaic, a specific, specific variant. And this is, again, something that um, becomes more and more rare when we um, we develop with the, with the years. So uh, these are two points that I would want to use, but for sure the material aspect of using this type of metals, this is something that you don't see later on. And that's what allows you to date it. That's what allows me to date it because otherwise I have so many, unfortunately, I have so many that are not from excavations. And of course, uh, um, I, I'm based on ex legal excavation that good archaeologists did, and this is what helps me to date them. So I actually want to follow up on the um, the history and the good archaeologists, and uh, whether you could reflect on um, how these dealers. And these buyers who were not necessarily scholars, but were, were engaged in a um, commercial enterprise, have shaped our knowledge of the past. Yeah, it's a very good question and something to think about. Um, I mentioned Nicole, Dr. Nicole Hayat, and uh, she is, I, I think she's a uh, Aziz Hayat is her grand grandfather, and I somehow like could reach reached her, uh, reached her, and we had a very interesting conversation. Conversation. It turns out that she is also a scholar, and she's working on this this question. She's asking, um, why would Aziz Hayat's work be different than? Oric Bates' work, because you see in this letter that he's writing to him, he's inviting him to his legal and academic excavations in Sebastia, but he wants to buy from him what he finds in Irbid. So how academic can that be like? And then he will go back to Boston with all the objects, including the things that he bought from local people there. So um, it's very mixed in this period. And this is something that um, I, I really wanted to know, like as, a, you know, as an archaeologist, I really wanted to know uh, where did the amulets come from? 
and I was looking in the letters of Aziz Khayyad and he, he gave me the answer. He said, most of them are from Irvid and one of them is from Bet She'an. But still from reading and from learning about the way he works, I, I understand that I can't be really certain because the, the common thing back then was, it wasn't even like a lie. He didn't say something that was not right in his own eyes, but this is the way people work, work then. I, uh, I will just add that the incantation balls, which are also, I mentioned before, it's a, it's a big uh, corpus of, of, of uh, uh, Sasanian Jewish uh, amulets. And uh, they are um, like the only incantation balls that we know, not the only, but the main body of incantation balls that today we know where it, uh, uh, that we can uh, say uh, for certain that we know their origin are from Nippur. And they are in uh, Penn University. And when I came there to work on the, on the balls, I said, okay, this is like real archeology. span We can now know know for sure at least that all of the, uh, the, the balls here are from Nippur. And then I spoke with someone there and he said, no, this is not the case. They had like a huge hunger there for years, like the University of Pennsylvania and all kinds of local dealers and sellers came to the you know, white archeologists and told them, you can, uh, I have something to sell to you. And they bought it and they put it in the hunger and then they brought everything to, to Pennsylvania, so to Penn University. So it's complicated. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, can I ask you a question about Mary Draper? Um, and two questions. The first is, what do we know or what do you know about her in terms of her religious background or any other sorts of clues that would help you understand why it was that she was so interested in amulets and magic to begin with? Like what sorts of, I don't know, religious movements, um, communities, um, ideas were popular at the time that might have made her interested in that topic? And then the second question is, um, are there other women in her archive? Um, was her world as preserved at the NYPL like a very, um, like a, a gendered male world where she was corresponding with all of these other men across the ocean and in New York? Or at, like, did she stand out at a, as a woman? Were there others? Um, and, and how, like, what did her world look like? Um, so, uh, Anna Draper, she called herself Anna, I'm not sure why, but her first name is Mary. So Anna Draper is, is a very interesting figure. And from working on her archive, it's funny because I'm not used to it. So you, you work on someone's archive, you get almost exclusively the letters that he got, but not the letters that he sent, she sent. So I almost don't have materials that belongs to her unless like someone is making copies, but she didn't make. Um, and um, so that's a conclusion that, uh, that she was interested in magic. That's a conclusion that I um, base on materials that I did find in her boxes. Like she kept all kinds of things and a lot of them are about magic. Um, she is uh, acting in a very uh, masculine world. Like she's not, she's I think the only woman I found there. Uh, sometimes Aziz Khayat sent her regards from his wife. That's the only, like, uh, but she, and it's very impressive in these years. Um, also, another thing that um, is interesting to say about her, I, when I started this project, I thought, okay, she was, like, rich. You know, she had money to spend. Like, she wanted to buy antiquities, like, everywhere. Like, what trendy, like. And, and this is not the case. You see how careful she is and how uh, picky she is about the things she buys. She's very aware, she's very smart. Um, and, and, um, and, and it's very interesting to see. On the other hand, sometimes I could, I told myself, oh, like when she sent her nephew, uh, a young, I don't know, student, uh, a text in Greek, to read to decipher for her and for sure he is amateur and he's not 
So you say this is very gender, like if she was a man, she would never send it to him. She's always consult consulting. A relationship with this food is very like it's 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 very obvious that he's giving the advice and she is asking. Um, but it, it's a very interesting uh, story. What I can say about her is that. Um, she was famous. If you open her Wikipedia uh, page, uh, it says that she uh, uh, cooperated with her husband uh, in his academic work. But for her collection, I think that she started to, to collect the antiquities only after he died. And this is something that really belongs to her. So it was very interesting for me to, to work on this material. If we don't have any more questions, I'll, I'll just reflect that I actually wonder if um, if her husband's death had anything to do with it um, in terms of collecting amulets for protection and healing mm -hmm. and um, and maybe, you know, it's conjecture, but um, but thinking about them as maybe being also personally meaningful in some way. Um, and also um, to say that there's a lot of conversation now, I think, about collecting and the practice of archiving and sort of collecting as doing something with materials that what weren't done to those materials before and then they change the materials themselves in, ter in terms of how we think about them together and so this is a really beautiful project because it takes a really small archive of six or seven amulets and the people who built it and I think one one thing that you could do with it further is to use it as a case study to sort of reflect more broadly on collecting and archiving as practices and also how that impacts um, the, the academic work that people do in antiquity. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, and we hope that you'll come back to more events um, in the future. Thank you. <laughs>